In October 1996, Wendy Myers, age 30, was reported missing to Lloyd Police in Ulster County, New York. She was described as a white female with a slim build, hazel eyes, and short brown hair. She was last seen in the Valley Rest Motel in Highland, a small town situated near the Hudson River banks just south of Kingston. Two months later, in early December 1996, Gina Barone was reported missing by her mother, Patricia Barone. Gina was 29 years old and had a slight build, brown hair, and an eagle tattooed on her back on her right arm. She had another tattoo that simply read Pop. Last November 29, 1996, she was last seen in Poughkeepsie on a street corner, apparently having a dispute with a man. Poughkeepsie is a small city of 28,000. Located 90 miles north of New York City, Dutchess County has a long and dramatic history that can easily be traced back to the Revolutionary War. Like any other modern municipality, though Poughkeepsie has its problems, there is a small but persistent drug trade centered in the downtown area that periodically erupts into violence. Prostitutes can often be seen working in the same area, and shootings are not at all uncommon. Some say Gina was arguing over drugs on November 29. Still, in any event, it was the last time anyone could remember seeing her alive. The missing person report was filed with the City of Poughkeepsie Police Department and assigned to the Detective Division. On January 1, 1997, the division came under Detective Lieutenant Bill Segrist, a 29-year veteran of the department. Although Wendy Myers's disappearance was filed with Lloyd Police Department's town, she was well known to Poughkeepsie Police. She frequented the downtown area of the city. Lieutenant Segrist became interested in the two cases. It seemed implausible that two girls who traveled in the same circles in the same city should suddenly disappear. It seemed like more than a coincidence, he said recently. Then, in January 1997, Kathleen Hurley, aged 47, disappeared. She was last seen walking along Main Street in the downtown area of Poughkeepsie. Kathleen, like the others, was white, had brown hair, and a slight build. The letters CJ were tattooed on her left bicep. Although it is not unusual for police to receive missing person reports, the three cases Hurley, Myers, and Barone seemed related. But people are reported missing for many reasons. Family disputes, simple runaways, drugs, and a nomadic lifestyle are just a few of those reasons. Sometimes people are arrested in other jurisdictions, and they neglect to notify their families. In other cases, people will simply move on to new areas, only to return a short time later. In most cases, the missing person turns up within a few days, and the report is subsequently cancelled. Nevertheless, the Poughkeepsie police were already interested in the cases. Lieutenant Segrist inquired about the Neighborhood Recovery Unit, the NRU, which is the department's narcotics unit. The NRU, like most police narc units, spends a lot of time on the streets and deals exclusively with confidential informants, drug dealers, convicted criminals, prostitutes, and other street dwellers almost daily. Usually, these units are a wealth of current information. The NRU reported to Lt. Segrist that some of the Central Street prostitutes complained of a local man who was rough with the girls and had been known to be violent during sex. He was Kendall Francois, who lived over on Fulton Avenue in Poughkeepsie, just minutes from the city's downtown area. Upon hearing this information, Lt. Segrist then contacted the town of Poughkeepsie Police and inquired about Francois. They reported that Francois had recently been the subject of an assault complaint by a prostitute. Armed with this information, detectives decided to maintain surveillance of Francois's home at 99 Fulton Avenue. But after several weeks of watching the residence in January 1997, no new information was developed. One prostitute cooperated with the police and allowed herself to be wired up and meet with Francois. 
The girl worked her usual spots in the city's downtown area until Francois arrived in his white Toyota Camry. Although she had clear instructions not to get into his vehicle, the girl could engage Francois in conversation. On several occasions, police monitored these meetings, but again, no useful information was obtained. Two months later, on March 7, 1997, a woman named Catherine Marsh was reported missing by her mother. Catherine was last observed November 11, 1996, also in the city of Poughkeepsie. Four months had passed since she was last seen alive, which made her case very difficult to investigate. Like the other girls, she was white, slight build, blue eyes, and brown hair. Her clothes and personal items were still at her apartment. Teletypes from across the nation were checked for recently discovered DDoS, who had not been identified. It is a routine practice for police to match up unidentified bodies with the missing reports. Rap sheets were requested on all the missing girls to ascertain if they were in custody somewhere. Canvases were made of the neighborhoods where the women frequented, and arrest records were checked and rechecked. Specially trained cadaver dogs from the Ramapo Rescue Squad were utilized to search areas in and around the city. The case came to a frustrating standstill, with no workable leads and no viable subjects. But as Lt. Egress points out, we had no evidence of criminality. So on the surface, the cases were simply a series of missing person reports. But on another level, the detective division was convinced something had happened to these women. In April 1997, Poughkeepsie police decided to contact the FBI for help. Although the FBI investigators were interested, they were limited by the case's circumstances to establish a profile of a suspect. They needed a crime scene. In this instance, there was no crime scene, and worse, it had not been established that a crime had even occurred. Simply put, there was not much the FBI could do. Mm. On October 9, 1997, Michelle is in 27 years old and was reported missing in Poughkeepsie. She, too, was last seen in the downtown area. But unlike all the others who were white, Michelle was an African American. She was also slight of build, barely 5 feet 2 and 115 pounds. Then, just one month later, on November 13, Mary Healy Giacconi, 29 years old, was reported missing. Still, this report was initiated by the police. Mary's mother died in October 1997. Mary's father, a retired New York State Corrections officer, came to the police to ask for help in locating her so he could give Mary the bad news. But police soon discovered that Mary was last seen alive in February 1997. On the same Poughkeepsie streets as some of the others. And like all of the others, Mary was small, 5 feet 4 inches, and weighed 110 pounds. Police increased their efforts in the case. The similarities between the girls were striking. All the girls lived in or near Poughkeepsie. All had the same physical build. Several of the girls had been arrested for prostitution, and most did not have regular contact with their families. But all shared one common bond. They had simply vanished. For the next few months, the police tried many different tactics to locate the missing women. Helicopter searches were made of the Dutchess County area by air. State police searched the Hudson River and municipalities along the shore regularly. Police informants were pressed for any information on the case. Hundreds of people were interviewed with no hard evidence, and nobody's police were stumped. Although they realized the suspicious nature of the disappearances, the investigation was at a standstill. But there was an ominous feeling among the detectives. Former FBI profiler Greg McCrary told the Associated Press that the disappearances were well beyond suspicious and because some of the women were prostitutes made the situation worse because prostitutes get into cars with just about anyone. To complicate the situation further, different suspects continuously drifted in and out of the case. 
One man from the South who had arrived in the Poughkeepsie area in the summer of 1997 became a suspect when it was revealed he was a convicted rapist and a suspect in an unrelated missing person case. Almost to the very end of the case, this individual was considered a primary suspect in the disappearance. Another city resident came to the police's attention when prostitutes said that he was very rough with the girls' cheering sex. In June of 1997, another local man was arrested for the rape and assault of a Poughkeepsie woman. Later, he was found to be in custody during the disappearances of the first three women. A boyfriend of one of the missing women was also considered suspect because he had an extensive criminal record and had assaulted women in the past. But as various suspects were developed and abandoned, Kendall Francois remained on the list. The public grew more concerned, and criticism of the police was growing. There was a feeling in the community that the police were not taking the report seriously. Since the missing women may have been prostitutes early on, street people were well aware of the situation since they were accustomed to seeing them daily. The disappearances were very obvious to them, but the police rejected the criticism. Lieutenant Segrist said. These girls don't have set schedules. It took time for the families to realize something was wrong, and then they even thought for a while they might turn up. By the time the stories began to appear in the newspapers, the city of Poughkeepsie police had already worked the case for more than eight months. Of course, the public could not be told of that investigation's details, so the police had to take the criticism, mostly in silence. In early July 1998, Poughkeepsie police decided to interview Francois about the missing women. They staked out the Francois home at 99 Fulton Avenue and soon discovered that Francois had a routine that he often followed. In the morning, he would take the family car, drive his mother to work at a nearby psychiatric center, where she was a nurse, drop her off, and then return to downtown Poughkeepsie, where he would cruise the streets. On one cold morning, Lt. Segrist and his detectives pulled over Francois. They asked him to come into the police department for an interview. Francois, who had a standard, respectful demeanor, readily agreed and drove his car over to the police station. Francois was interviewed over several hours and answered all questions police asked of him. Of course, police still had no concrete ideas precisely what had happened to the missing girls and no clue where they could be found. But Francois was easy to talk to and cooperative. The police, however, were not convinced. Poughkeepsie police accompanied him to his home, where Francois even led a detective inside his room. For a brief time, the detective reported that the inside of the house was in horrendous condition. There was garbage virtually everywhere he could see. It smelled awful, but Francois made no admissions and said nothing incriminating. By law, he was free to go about his business. Then, in late January 1998, Kendall Francois was arrested for assaulting a prostitute. The crime took place on the second floor of 99 Fulton Avenue. At the time, the girl said, she was picked up by Kendall Francois on Cannon Street, Poughkeepsie, near South Hamilton. Kendall drove her to his house, where he took the girl up to his room. On the second floor. They had a dispute over money, and Kendall punched her in the face, knocking her down onto the bed. Then he got on top of her and began to choke her with his bare hands. She agreed to have sex with him, and when he finished, he brought the girl back to Cannon Street. The victim reluctantly reported the incident to the police and press charges against him. Francois was arrested and received the assistance of an attorney. Later, on May 5, he pled guilty to third-degree assault, a misdemeanor in city court. He spent a total of 15 days in jail. On June 12, 1998, Sandra Jean, French, aged 51, disappeared. She was white, 5 feet, just 120 pounds brown eyes, and a very slight build. She was reported missing from Dover's small town, which is about 20 miles east of Poughkeepsie. Her car was found abandoned in the town of Poughkeepsie, barely three blocks from the Francois home. 
In July 1998, the Missing Women's Task Force was formed, consisting of full-time police investigators from Poughkeepsie, the town of Poughkeepsie, and the New York State Police. The task force was under the command of the city of Poughkeepsie, ease Sergeant Michael Harkin. The task force took up residence in the city's downtown area at Market and Main Street, not far from the police station. But the existence of the team was not announced, nor was it publicized. This team's formation was an unusual event because task forces such as these are usually assembled after bodies are found, and foul play is apparent. The workload was enormous. Each tip or scrap of information had to be evaluated and acted upon as deemed essential. Every day, detectives studied the teletypes from National Crime Information Center, the NCIC. These teletypes originate from every police municipality in the nation and report on every single unidentified body in America 365 days a year. Attempts to match up any of the girls to the reports were fruitless. Many on the investigative team were convinced that the girls were already dead, the victim of some unknown serial killer. Others were not so sure. But the task force was ordered not to talk about any details of the case, an essential point to any successful police investigation. The need for confidentiality is paramount and murder investigations more so in multiple homicides. The revelation of some important detail or the publication of some other investigation aspect could alert the killer and wreck the case or, worse, induce the killer to flee. It's a possibility that they are linked, state police investigator Monty Martin said to the press on July 26, 1998. But we can't say anything at this point. Just one month later, on August 26, 1998, Katina Newmaster, 25 years old, vanished like almost all the others. She was slight of build brown hair and was last seen in the same downtown streets of Poughkeepsie. At the police department. Pressures to solve the case were enormous. A sudden feeling of urgency descended upon the community. There was real fear on the streets. People were afraid to come outside, especially street dwellers. We're low lifers. That's what it comes down to. People don't care that we're missing because they think we don't belong on the streets in the first place. It's not just the police, it's the community, a prostitute had told the journal on July 26, 1998, but they were wrong. The police were taking it very seriously and had been for nearly 22 months. Thousands of hours of investigative work had already been expanded on the case. The city of Poughkeepsie Police Town of Poughkeepsie, Town of Lloyd, the New York State Police and the FBI had all worked together on the investigation, which had grown to epic proportions. The families of the missing girls were numb from worry. In a prophetic statement to the Albany Times, Patricia Barone, whose daughter had been missing nearly two years, said. If they find one of them, they'll find all of them. I'm sure of that. She didn't know how right she was. Of course, she had no way of knowing that. Not far from the Market Street office, where the members of the task force diligently processed their paperwork every day, a house of horrors awaited them. The home was set on a quiet residential block in the shadow of the famous Faster College, a dark, gloomy two-story house virtually across the street from a funeral home, a place that neighbors and children knew well. They saw it every day as they walked to work park, their cars rode, their bicycles played on the street, the local mailman in some neighborhood kids, the usual delivery people. They knew it, too. Everyone in the neighborhood knew the house well because it stunk to high heaven. On Tuesday, September 1, 1998, at about 8.30 in the morning, in the second-floor bedroom of the same house, a young woman quietly was strangled. She was a slightly built woman who had gone there to get paid for sex. The person trying to kill her was a huge man, whom she had seen before on the city streets. Late at night, cruising for girls, he had his huge hands wrapped around her throat, his thumbs pressed deep into her flesh while she fought against him. With all the strength God could give her. 
Somehow she wriggled free and convinced the man to let her go. He agreed to drive her back to Main Street, where he had picked her up. A short time ago, they got into his white car and drove to a local gas station. But just before he pulled into the station, the girl jumped from the car and ran away. The man continued to drive down the street at the exact moment and less than one block away. Detective Skip Mundane and Bob McCready were in their unmarked car, preparing to hand out flyers asking the public for help in the Cantina New Master disappearance. Within seconds, they saw the huge man in his familiar white camera and waved to him. The man quickly waved back because he recognized Detective Mundane from previous contacts. It was Kendall Francois. As the officers pulled into the same gas station that Francois just left, a man came up to the car. He told the police that a girl who is now walking away said she was just assaulted quickly. The cops located the girl who confirmed the attack. She was brought to the police station, where she filed a complaint against Francois. That same afternoon, the police returned to 99 Fulton Avenue to talk with Kendall Francois about his most recent attack. They asked him to come into the police department to discuss the report. He agreed and was taken to headquarters over the next few hours. Francois eventually made many admissions regarding the disappearance of the women. He was arrested and charged with a single count of murder in the death of Katina Newmaster on August 26, 1998. The police were satisfied. A search warrant was drawn up and signed. Then, on September 2, 1998, shortly after midnight, a team of detectives, the district attorney, EMS Cruz crime scene processors, and an army of cops drove over to 99 Fulton Street and entered into the House of Horrors. Police knocked on the door, and it was soon answered by Kendall's mother. The officers informed Kendall's parents and sister of the purpose of the visit. They were taken to the town of Poughkeepsie Police Department while the police began their search. Within the hour, they located the first body. The house was immediately surrounded by police and secured. We were resolved to preserve the scene at any cost, said Lieutenant Segrist. Rather than work the house throughout the night, the New York State Police decided to process the crime scene. Beginning at daylight 99, Fulton was a two-story green colonial home situated in the middle of the block, sandwiched between two other similar houses. It looked like any other home on the block. However, it had a slightly run-down appearance, according to the town of Poughkeepsie Assessor's Office. The house built on less than a quarter acre was sold in 1975 to McKinley H. and Paulette Francois for $11,500. Compared to others in that section of town, the neighborhood is average, and many homes in that same area rent to college students. In the morning, the police, dressed in sterile white suits and wearing anti-putrefied cation masks, entered the home. The house was filled with garbage strewn everywhere on the floors, furniture in the sinks, and closets. Clothes were piled on every inch of floor space, and sheets were pulled over the windows. One detective remarked that he had never seen such wretched living conditions in all his years on the job. The stench was overpowering. It permeated every room, every corner, and seeped out into the street like some toxic cloud. Within an hour, Hundreds of people gathered outside the building. The word had spread that Kendall Francois had been arrested for murder. Dozens of people from the media descended upon the neighborhood. Spotlights and cameras soon lined the street. As the police went about their morbid business, relatives of some of the victims arrived to watch the gruesome story unfold. A woman's body was found in the attic, then another, and still another. Some spectators ran from the scene, gagging on the overpowering smell of death and garbage. District Attorney William Grady told the newspapers that eight bodies are inside that house based on what the suspect told us. Slowly, in a grim pageant of death, the bodies were removed from the house. The corpses were in various states of decomposition, some far advanced beyond the putrefaction stage. Insect activity was widespread, and there were indications of rodent presence. 
The bodies were located in several different structure areas, often covered with clothes or blankets, the New York Daily News said. When cops went to the green aluminum sided house at 99 Fulton Avenue, they were nearly bowled over by the stench of rotting flesh. Detectives knew that it would be days before identifications could be made. Estimates of time of death in such cases are difficult, if not impossible, to determine. There is only one rigid rule. The more extended period between death and the estimate, the more inaccurate the assessment will be. Also present in the growing crowd on Fulton Avenue was Patricia Barone, mother of Gina Barone, who was reported missing back in December 1996. Mrs. Barone stood bravely with her family, but she was prepared for the worst. In my head. I come to terms with it. I had a feeling she was gone all this time. I always felt that when the good Lord thought I was ready to hear it, I'd listen to it, she told reporters from New York Times. Over the next five days, the police investigators continued their search for bodies and evidence. The crowds got bigger. The media was everywhere. Relatives of victims gathered outside and held vigils and remembrance of their loved ones. On September 5, the eighth and last body was removed from the Francois home. Then the first body found was identified as Katina Newmaster, the last girl to be reported missing. Identifications of Gina Barone, Sandra French, and Catherine Marsh quickly followed. It was a few days later. Wendy Myers, Kathleen Hurley, and Mary Giacconi were also identified. Police made another gruesome discovery. Later identified as Audrey Puglia, says age 34, one body was from New Rochelle, New York. She had not been reported missing. How she came to be inside the house. No one knew only the enigmatic Kendall. Francois could provide a clue, but he wasn't talking. Kendall was charged with second-degree murder on the morning of September 2, represented by an attorney. He would not make any further statements, but he was well known in the city of Poughkeepsie, one prostitute told the journal. Most of us knew him. We did crack together. Kendall Francois was born in the city of Poughkeepsie and grew up on Fulton Avenue. He attended Arlington High School. The 6 feet 4 inch teenager played football on the school team until he graduated in 1989. He joined the Army in 1990 went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, for basic training. In 1993, Kendall attended class at Dutchess County Community College. As a liberal arts major, he studied as a student on and off until 1998. Although he was not working at the time of his arrest, he did have several jobs in the past. Kendall was employed at the Arlington Middle School, a few miles from Fulton Avenue, from 1996 to 97 as a school monitor. Some teachers at the school complained about Kendall's behavior, especially toward the female students. He often inappropriately played with the girls, touching their hair and telling sexual jokes. Although he had a clean record at the middle school, the children had a strange name for Kendall. They called him Stinky. During the period surrounding the disappearances, Kendall Francois lived at home with his mother, father, and younger sister. She continued to deny any knowledge of the killings. Many people wondered how the parents could not have known what was going on, especially Kendall's mother, who was employed as a nurse for many years at the Hudson River Psychiatric Center in Poughkeepsie. Indeed at least she would have suspected, but it was reported that Kendall had told his parents a family of raccoons had died in the attic, and he was having trouble removing the carcasses. This explanation seemed to suffice. In a statement issued through their attorney, the family had this to say. We find ourselves plagued by unimaginable circumstances. Our youngest son is suspected of committing grave offenses from which his life hangs in the balance. We have virtually lost everything, been dispossessed of our home, and cast into the street with only the clothes on our backs. The family requests that under these extraordinary circumstances, the public and media respect the only two items we have now our privacy and personal respect in him.